Notice it. Forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. He's giving them this whole thing about now let your petitions be, be made known. Come unto him boldly unto the throne of grace that you might obtain mercy to help in the time of need. And let your requests be made known unto him. And notice what he says in verse 5. Then Jesus said to them, because all of this is connected to prayer. He says, suppose you have a friend and you go out to him at midnight and say, friend, Lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no other food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed, and I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you that even though he will not get up and give you bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity he will surely get up and give you as much as you need so i say to you ask and it will be given seek and you will find knock and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks the door will be open this is talking about prayer prayer is a door opener prayer is a door opener and he says you do it through your impunity, your, your refusal to give up. You've got to have a tenacity in prayer. You don't pray until you get tired. You pray until you get through. You have to pray through them. Old saints, they talk about pray through, baby. Pray through. You didn't just get on there and you, just, you know, five minutes. You, you can't put God on a stopwatch. You, you have to pray through. There are times that you'll go through a season of prayer and even after you have to get them and go to work, you got to finish, you got to enter it back in. You got to pray through you. Sometimes you might go through a whole season. You might be praying a whole week over something, a whole month. You, you, God can have you in a whole season of prayer until you pray through. And then all of a sudden, one day, you'll feel when that thing breaks. You, you carry burdens in prayer like a woman carries a baby. And then there's a, there's a travailing. There's a travailing where you, you then, you, it's as though you give birth in the spirit even before you've given birth in the natural. You got to birth it in the spirit first. And so there's a travail. You, you carry this thing. And see, I want you to realize this, that life with God is like a game of chess. It's like a game of checkers. You've got first move. And, and, and oftentimes we're waiting on God, but God's really waiting on us. We think that we prayed and we're waiting on God, but the truth of the matter is God is waiting on you. God's waiting on you. Didn't he say it in 2 Corinthians I mean, Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, not my hand, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. God says, if you do these things, then I'll do it. He's saying, you've got first move. If you'll humble yourself, if you'll humble yourself, if you'll humble yourself, people are talking, well, I haven't received my vision yet. He hasn't fulfilled my dream yet. You don't have to lower your dream. You don't have to lower your vision, lower your ego. Oh. Lower your ego. Lower your ego. If my people will humble themselves, humble themselves and then pray, because when you're arrogant, you won't even realize that you have need of God. When you're arrogant, you won't even, you got too much pride to try to ask anything because it shows you're needy. See, arrogant folk won't even let you know that they need anything. They'd be just arrogant. Sometimes they just, I mean, they'd be just as broke as Cooter Brown. <laughs> broke, but too proud to let anybody know it. See, arrogance will keep you from asking. And that's, that's why he says, humble yourself and then pray. Because if you're arrogant, your prayer won't work. God abhors the proud. So he says, humble yourself and then pray. Humble yourself and then pray. See, you've got first move. This, this reminds me of how God works. Uh, have you ever, you know, walked up to a, a, a person's house and, and uh, they have a, a motion detector light? It, you know, and, and here it's, it's as though we are asking God, you know, God, put light on my path. Show me which way to go. And God has said, you know what? I'm waiting to detect your motion. When I detect your motion, the light will come on. His word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Psalm 119, isn't that what he says? So God is looking for your motion. When, you have, when he sees your motion, the light will turn on. 
when he sees your motion, the light will turn on. And we're saying, God, show me which one. Show me where to go. God says, just get in motion. Get in motion. I want to see that you're moving. The moment that you start moving, you'll be healed as you go. Heal as you go. He's got a motion detector. God is waiting on you to bust a move. He's waiting on you to bust a move. So there's a motion detection that is going on. It is the same as walking up to the supermarket. And then voila, the door opens because it senses your motion. It's either from a motion detector or there are sensors that are in a pad that's on the floor. But the door won't open until you start stepping you got to start to step in before the door will open and see we're wondering Lord is, is this door gonna open and see sometimes you, you, you walk up to it the motion detector has to pick up your motion God's a motion detector and the light doesn't turn on until you get in motion and the door doesn't open until you get in motion God will tell you to do some things and you won't even know and you just got to go trusting and Lord I don't know how this is gonna turn out I know you told me to go down there I don't know how it's going to turn out. I don't know where, I, you know, I don't have enough money, Jesus, but he told you to go. And you get in motion, God will then open the door. God will then turn on the light. Does that make sense to you? And so we are so grateful to the Lord because of that. And so one sign that you're growing as a Christian is that your prayers are less dominated by give me this and give me that. And your prayers become more dominated by Lord give me you Lord give me you and then dominated by this kind of prayer Lord make me a blessing so I can bless somebody else make me a blessing so I can bless somebody else Lord give me you Lord give me you Lord give me you make me a blessing and I want you to understand this principle that being a Christian doesn't always change what you deal with it but it changes how you deal with it it doesn't always change what you deal with but it changes how you deal with it because when you're in trouble prayer is sort of like a raft you know one of those life boys that's thrown out to you a little circle kind of thing that's thrown out to you when you're in the water it doesn't always necessarily get you out of the water, but it keeps you from drowning until you can get out. And that's what sometimes that prayer is. It, you, you're in the water and you would drown without it. And see, we're still panicking because we're still in the water, but he's saying, you know, just rest on me. I've given you a word. I've given you, I'm, I've thrown this out. That's your life, boy. That's your, that's, that's your boy. And I want you to hold on to that because that'll keep you from going under. You're in the water and I know that it's all surrounding you. But God is like, I've got you, I've got you, I've got you. I want you to realize prayer, prayer is, a, is an exercise of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says this, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. See, here's what I want you to see is that without seeing God, we believe that he exists. Without seeing God, we believe that he hears us. Without seeing God, we believe that he cares. And without seeing God, we believe that he will answer us. Without seeing him, we must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those of us who diligently, diligently not stop on and off, but diligently seek him. We believe he exists. We believe that he hears us. We believe that he cares and we believe that he will answer us. But Satan is the great deceiver. He always tries to deceive you into thinking that your prayers are a waste of time. You know why he does that? So that you'll stop praying. He starts whispering certain things to you. See, you ever notice Revelations chapter 12 and verse 9? This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. See, the great deceiver, that's just one of his names, the great deceiver. He tries to deceive people to believe that what God has said is not so. But prayer is powerful. And that's why the devil tries to dissuade you from doing it because it is so powerful. You wonder why the devil attacks people when they pray? My goodness. 
I mean, if you're going to be an intercessor, you, you, you're a warrior. That's why they call them prayer warriors, because you get satanic attack when you start praying. Now, here's some signs of demonic dissuasion during prayer, how the devil tries to dissuade you from praying. Here's one of the first things, sleepiness. Anybody ever been there, you start trying to pray and you get all sleepy? You were fine before you started praying. And then all of a sudden you yawn and just, you get that itis. <laughs> sleepiness, sleepiness. And then have you experienced this one, wandering thoughts? Here you there praying, your mind is up, wondering about what you're having for lunch and dinner and what you're going to eat and who's calling, what's coming on TV and what, you know, who has messaged you. And, and then what about this, interruptions? Isn't it amazing? You get ready to pray. Here come the telephone ringing. Now here you, you feel your phone buzzing. You got some notification. One of your children busting in there. Mama! <laughs> just, uh, just interruption. It, just, it was fine until you started praying. You ever notice that? This is stuff that the devil attacks you. And then here's an, uh, the fourth one. It's subliminal subjection that your prayer is not being heard or, or won't make a difference. The devil is just telling you, you're just praying. That's not, going, that's not making a difference. He's trying to attack you, he, to dissuade you from praying. I wonder why the devil would spend so much time and energy and effort to dissuade you from praying if prayer was nothing. He wouldn't fight it if there were no power in it. But prayer is the mitochondria. It is the powerhouse of the, of the Christian faith. And, and let me just tell you this. Pain can make you pray and prayer can make you powerful. Pain can make you pray and prayer can make you powerful. Pain can make you pray and prayer can make you powerful and this is what I want you to understand praise shifts your focus and prayer shifts the burden praise shifts the focus when you begin to praise your focus comes off of your problem and onto your God praise shifts your focus but prayer shifts the burden praise so and that's why you have to praise and pray you have to praise and pray because praise shifts your focus. How great and marvelous are you, God, to the great greatness of God, the grandeur of God, the, 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 uh, the omnipotence of God, the omniscience of God, the omnipresence of God. Praise shifts your focus, but prayer shifts the burden. And I want you to realize this. Begin your prayer. Uh, your prayer life with short prayers and increase it over time. I know that this, you, you might be inspired by somebody who said that they pray an hour. Well, you may not be able to pray an hour yet. Start where you are. Start where you are. Just start where you are. Just a little begins a process. See, here's what Start with small, short prayers. Start with small, short prayers. Particularly, if you are not in the habit of praying, start with small, short prayers prayers. And particularly if you're working with children, start with small, short prayers. You can't go into deep intercession with a young child because they'll be opening their eyes and looking around at you like you're crazy. And you're just going on, you're into deep intercession, your child is not even... Start with small, short prayers. Then secondly, continue with frequent times of prayer throughout the day. See? So if you're praying short prayers, you can pray those frequently. Pray them frequently. Get in your automobile, say a prayer. Get, in your, get, in, get on, a, on the bus, say a prayer. If you ride public transportation, say a prayer. <laughs> you get on martyr, say a prayer. Say a prayer. See, continue with frequent times of prayer throughout the day. Every time you think about God, just say a prayer. Here's the third thing. Build into fervent, burning prayer. Start small. And then do it frequently. And then you build into fervent, burning prayer. And then number four, you mature into causing your life to be an answer to someone else's prayer. It's one thing to receive an answer. It's another thing to pray for an answer. It's another thing to be an answer. The real intercessor will mature into causing your life to be an answer to someone else's prayer when God makes you an answer to prayer. And let me just tell you this. Prayer doesn't always move God, but prayer often puts you where God is moving. I want you to understand that very clearly. Prayer doesn't always move God, but prayer will put you where God is moving. You remember in, uh, in Acts chapter 9, there was a man by the name of Ananias. A and the Lord spoke to him, and, and, and he, says, he says, a man Saul, who, who was Paul, he says, 
this man is, is blind and he says, I want you to get up and go to a street called Street. God told him exactly what street, and he said, and I want you to go to a particular house and, uh, and inquire of this man and lay your hands on him so he can receive his sight because he's praying. And so it didn't, it didn't move God to do something, but God moved him to get to where he was moving. God says, you get to a street called Street and told him exactly which house to go to. I mean, the Holy Ghost knows your address. That ought to be really comforting to you to even know that, that, that. So prayer doesn't always move God, but prayer will put you to where God is moving. Sometimes God will tell you, get up and go. Jeremiah, get thee down to the potter's house. That's why I'm getting ready to do something. I want to put you on the scene. Prayer will put you to where God is moving. Sometimes God will move you. When you pray, God will put you into the place where he's moving. And you see, you're thinking that he's going to always start right where you are, but sometimes prayer will just put you into where God is moving. Because prayer is something that God rewards. Prayer is something God rewards. Notice Matthew chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face, then no one will notice that you're fasting except your father who knows what you do in private and your father who sees everything will reward you. Your father who sees everything will reward you. He sees in, in, in what you do in private and he'll reward you in public. Here's the principle. What man rewards, God doesn't. And what man doesn't reward, God does. God rewards prayer. God rewards fasting. Prayer is a secret weapon. It's a secret weapon. It's a secret weapon. You know why I say that it's a secret weapon? Because Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, likewise, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. See that capital S? That's the Holy Spirit who intercedes for the saints according to the will of God to pray for things that you don't even know to pray for. And I want you to know that we can always learn a couple of things from Elijah, the prophet that prayed in the Old Testament. Notice in James chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. And I want you to just see just a few things that Elijah did in his prayer life that we can learn from today. Number one, from Elijah's example, we learn to be totally dependent upon God. Totally dependent upon God. Because when Elijah prayed, God told him in 1 uh, Kings chapter 17 to go down to the brook Kirith. And he says, you get to this brook Kirith, and there I am going to command the ravens to feed you. And they brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and then he drank of the brook. He had nothing. He had no food, he had no provisions, he had no water, and he, and he prayed and God provided. He was totally dependent upon God because God sent him to a place where he had no resources or connections. He was totally dependent upon God. So we learn from Elijah to be totally dependent upon God. Number two, from Elijah's prayers, we learn to point people back to God. We learn to point people back to God. Your prayers should not just be selfish about what God can do for you. It's to point people back to God. Notice how Elijah prayed in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 37. O oh Lord, answer me. Answer me so that these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Let them pray. God answer so they'll know you are God. Let, let it point people back to God. Let your prayer point people back to God. Whatever issues that you deal with in your life, every problem is an opportunity for God to be glorified. You point them back to God. I mean, if you know that God is the one that helped you to get the promotion, that he helped you to get the job, that he helped you to get your loan approved for a car, for a house, if you know that God did it, don't try to act like you all that in a bag of chips. You know, you better just point people back to God and say, you know what, I pray. I know who I am and what I was able to. You know, point people back to God. That's what Elijah did. He says, God answers so that these people will know that you are God. 
And then the third thing from Elijah's prayers, we learn to pray diligently until we see the answer. We learn to pray diligently until we see the answer. We talked about it in 1 Kings uh, chapter 18 when they were up on Mount Carmel. And uh, he put his head between his knees. And he had his servant Gehazi uh, uh, or Elisha. And, and, and he says, go, go down and check, check and see. Go, go down and check and see. I want you to go and check and see whether the cloud is there or not. Yes. And he went back and there's no sign of it. The second time, there's no sign. The third time, there's no sign. You know, the fourth time, he said, go back again. Yes. This man prayed. He's, he's, he won't even look up. He's got his head. He's in the birthing position. He's in the birthing prayer position. And he, he won't even lift his head up. He says, I, I'm praying and I, I know prayer is powerful. Yes. And he said, go, go back again the fourth time. He sent him back a fifth time. Yes. I know his servant was probably getting frustrated. But we learn diligence. How many times have you prayed about something that hadn't gotten the answer yet? Yes. The sixth time. And then the seventh time, he says, he came back with a, with a small report. Yeah. It, it always starts little, little begins the process. He says, I see a little cloud about the size of a man's hand. He says, you better prepare the chariot. You, it's getting ready to pour down. It's getting ready to rain cats and dogs. You better, you better prepare this thing. No matter how long it takes, don't give up on prayer. Men ought always to pray. Men ought always to pray. Men ought always to pray. I heard the Lord say this so clearly to me, that these now again are the days of Elijah. The days of Elijah. The days of Elijah. What was so remarkable about Elijah? Elijah, more than anything else, had this supernatural capacity to be able to pray the fire down. This man had an anointing to pray fire down. And I'm telling you, we need a fire on the earth once again. We need a fire on the earth. These are the days of Elijah. It's prayer time, church. It's prayer time, church. People's fire has gone out. They're crazy. Folks, children are crazy. Mamas and daddies are crazy. Grandmamas and granddaddies are crazy. It's time now. These are the days of Elijah. It's prayer time for somebody to get on their knees and to begin to pray, to pray until the power comes down. He needs Elijah's that will start praying until prayer fire comes down on the altar. That, that's no wonder there's nothing happening on the altars nowadays. There's no prayer. That's why he said that before Jesus could come, the spirit of Elijah would have to come. And, and he would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the father, lest I smite the earth with a curse. And the curse of this generation is fatherlessness because we need somebody who can pray the fire down. Marriages have grown cold today because people have stopped praying. God has gotten out of the schools and he's gotten out of the government because people have failed to pray. It's prayer time until somebody gets a burden to pray and will put their head between their knees and get in the birthing position. He needs these are the days of Elijah. It's prayer time, church. It is prayer time, church. It is prayer time. I pray that you will hear that there is a call of the Spirit of God calling you. He is summoning you. You've been summoned. You've been drafted. There's a call now because there's a need for fire. Because so many in this world have grown cold. And God has said, I need fire. I need fire. You need to get your fire back. You need to get your fire back. It's time for a fresh testimony. It is time for a fresh testimony. It's time for a fresh testimony. The devil is loose. He's having havoc all over the world. We need fire, fire, fire. You don't have to explain fire. Fire explains itself. You don't have to let people know that the fire is there. When the fire is there, you feel its presence. You see its presence. And we can just get the fire that was always in the tabernacle supposed to be fire. There was fire in it, in the outer court. There was fire in the inner courts. There was fire. There was fire. There was sacrifices. There was fire. Nothing gets consumed until there's a fire. And while we build structures and programs, if there is no fire... It is as though it is a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. It's time for the return of the fire. And he needs, he's looking for Elijah's. These are the days of Elijah. I heard the Lord say it this morning. I didn't really understand exactly what it was. But these are the days of Elijah's. He needs Elijah's that will rise up today. The strength of Elijah 
was in his ability to pray down fire. It's time for a showdown on Mount Carmel because the prophets of Baal have been running havoc in the land. And there is only one and true and living God. And this God who answers by fire, fire, Holy Ghost fire, revival fire, this God. It's prayer time now. Marriages and families have gone apart because there's no fire. Churches have been built and there's no fire. He's not looking for structures. The fire is in heaven. Only God has the fire. And when we pray and ask him, God, send the fire. Send the fire. And instead of getting bulls and rams and doves, goats and sheep, he says, you get on the altar. Present yourself a living sacrifice. And when you pray because it is as though we are dead and when the fire touches, it becomes heaven's defibrillator that puts new life back in us once again. And God breathes this fire that he puts in the soul of mankind. May he be a living fire. It's time now for the fire because these are the days of Elijah's. He's looking for Elijah's now. God's raising up an army of intercessors that will pray until the fire comes down. This won't be the result of one person praying. This is not outstanding superstars in prayer. This is when God will raise up a nation of Elijah's where you will become a kingdom of priests unto him that will begin to pray because there are some demonic things that are grabbing hold on the earth and they won't be destroyed until fire touches it. And I'm just telling you, these are the days of Elijah. And unless we start praying like Elijah prayed, he was a human being. You saw that in James, just like we are. He had no special privilege. He was a human being. He had no more right to the power of God than you do, than I do. Things happen when people pray because there's a power in prayer. When you pray and you depend upon God, I mean, you will be determined that you are going to be unrelenting and not be discouraged that you've not gotten an immediate answer because God rules and super rules and he's the God who was and is and is to come. And so he's never frustrated by time. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bryant. Join us again next time for Power for Living, where revelation is power, power for living.